So today we're going to talk about animal behavior. So ethology is the science of studying animal behavior. Um, animal behavior is defined quite generally as a response to a stimuli in the environment. Um, stimuli would be the event that causes the behavior. It could be anything from you feel cold, so you put on a sweatshirt. Um, you feel an itch, so you scratch. Anything like that would work. Um, behaviors are usually innate or learned. Innate usually means instinctual. That is something you are born with. Kind of like a reflex would be an innate behavior. They are automatic. Um, you kind of just do them without thinking. So right now, you're blinking, you're breathing. Um, those are all behaviors that you don't even, weren't even conscious you were doing. Those are innate behaviors. We're going to talk about something called a fixed action pattern, which um, you see kind of a, a series of events that usually occur no matter what. Um, this is going to allow for early survival of babies. Um, it allows for reproduction, um, other survival things like kinesis and taxis involving in evolution, kind of just automatic things that will happen um, to keep the organism alive. And then learned behavior is anything that you develop during life. Usually you learn from others in your species, in your family group. Um, you learn by watching. Um, these can change according to the environment, so you can learn new behaviors, you can get rid of learned behaviors, um, but that's anything that you're adding after birth. So an example of one such behavior is male stickleback fish will show aggression towards any shape that has a red underbelly. So stickleback fish males have a red belly on the bottom. Um, so males have learned or have instinctual behaviors to attack other males, kind of like uh, territoriality type thing. And experiments were done that saw even unrealistic models, so models that didn't even look like fish, um, would have atta be attacked by the stickleback fish if they had a red belly. And they even went further and found that if you had a realistic model of a stickleback fish that didn't have a red belly, it wouldn't attack it. So it was more the red that was causing or the, the stimulus to that behavior. This is an example, one example of a fixed action pattern that the fish is going to attack anything with a red belly kind of automatically. Another example of a fixed action pattern um, is a duck uh, with, with eggs or a goose with eggs. So one of the defining characteristics of a fixed action pattern is that it occurs no matter what, um, and it occurs to completion no matter what. So the behavior is that if an egg rolls out of a, a goose's nest, it will go get it and roll it back into the nest. And that obviously makes sense for survival of the, of the egg, of the species. But what we found is the uh, goose will bring back any object that's near its nest. So you can see here it's bringing back a can. Um, it will even do an uh, egg that's not even its own egg. Um, that's kind of the fixed action pattern part of it, the part where it's no matter what happens, it's going to do the same thing. Um, they will also do it to completion. So once it starts rolling the egg back in, it will continue that rolling motion until it reaches the nest, even if the egg like falls out. Um, if So the egg like rolls away, it will continue to pull it back all the way to the nest. And then what would happen is if it rolled away, it would go back out and start the process again. So the defining features of a fixed action pattern is that they um, are innate um, and that the animal will do them no matter what and do them to completion. So two more specific examples of innate um, behavior would be what we call directed movements, which are taxis or kinesis. So taxis is when an animal is going to change direction, either what we call positive or negative towards or away from the stimulus. Um, so you see here this positive taxis, um, this fish is facing the current. Um, that's because where the food's going to come, so it knows kind of to follow the direction of the current. Um, there's tons of examples of types of taxis. Um, chemotaxis would be towards or away chemicals. Phototaxis would be poor, towards or away light. There's things that towards or away gravity type of thing. So again, that's change in direction. <clears throat> Kinesis is change in rate of movement. So that would be speeding up or slowing down. Um, so you see here, this is the bug trying to get under the moist leaf. They kind of run faster. This is any time an animal's gonna run faster if it senses danger, that's all kinesis movement. Uh, an example of a complex innate behavior is migration. So lots of animals migrate as a whole. Um, they could do it for various reasons. Usually it has to do with seasonal things, food availability, stuff like that. Um, so you see here um, examples of migration patterns. This is butterflies. Um, right here, you're going to see a bobolink, which is a bird. This is another type of bird. Again, whales do this. It's usually in response to food or weather. Um, you will see migratory restlessness in birds that are raised in captivity. So birds know they should be migrating, and if they can't, they get restless. 
Um, these animals are going to navigate by the sun and the stars, which is quite interesting. That's how they know where to go. So we also see it around here with geese, right? The geese are going to migrate here. I have kids ask me sometimes, uh, I thought geese are supposed to go south in the winter. The geese that we have around here are south. <laughs> so the geese that you see around here are from Canada. So we are south for them. Another type of uh, Nate, kind of Nate and learning together is imprinting. So this is where you have a critical period during infancy where the baby will imprint on the caregiver. Um, the interesting part about this is it's not necessarily the mom. So um, you see ducks all the time following mom. Ducks are going to imprint. But also if you, we've had ducks raised by humans that, innate, uh, uh, that imprint on a person. So imprinting is not necessarily with mom. Usually it's mom because she's usually the caregiver. Um, but any kind of the first caregiver that they have, they imprint on. And you can see how that makes sense for survival, following that person around to get the food. Um, one funny thing you see with the with pandas that are born in captivity, um, China is trying to um, take pandas and actually put them in the wild. So if you see a panda baby caregiver in a panda suit, the reason they're in the panda suit is so that, that that baby does not get accustomed to humans. So they're trying to trick the baby into being imprinted on pandas, not humans. Um, so when you see that in the little costumes, that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to make sure the babies do not imprint on a human. The two main types of learned behavior, um, associative learning or operating classical conditioning. This is where you learn to associate a stimulus with a consequence or a response. Um, the difference is operant is trial and error with reward or punishment. And then classical is where you have a neutral stimulus or a stimulus that has nothing to do with the response um, that causes a response. So here we have an example of operant conditioning. This is a you know, positive or negative stimulus directly associated with the behavior. So you see here the mouse learns to press the lever, and when it presses the lever, it will get food. So it kind of learns, hey, press the lever, get food, press the lever, get food. That's a reward type behavior. Um, there could also be a punishment type behavior where you know it could get zapped or something like that to learn. Um, but these are all kinds of operant conditionings where you're learning based on positive or negative reinforcement. Classical conditioning is where the stimulus has nothing to do with the response. So in the previous slide, the pet food pellet came directly when the lever was pushed. This example is Pavlov's dogs. He's a classic psychologist that did this. What he did is he created a connection between a bell ringing and dog salivating for dinner. So essentially he had this weird contraption, um, but he would ring a bell, feed the dog, ring a bell, feed the dog, ring a bell, feed the dog. And what happens is the dog started to salivate and expect food with a bell with no food in sight. So it wasn't the food that was causing the response. It was actually just the bell. Um, so these are kind of... a uh, non-connected stimulus response type things. We learn a lot of our learning and behaviors uh, through social interactions. So this is between individuals of the same species and a family group. Um, these are going to develop due to evolutionary adaptation. So one of the reasons why this happens is for you to survive. So you're going to learn how to you know, survive from your family group. Um, it allows for communication and language. Um, agnostic behavior is fighting. So that's like here and here. Um, kind of if you want to think about dominance hierarchy, that's all kind of related to how you, how you behave in the social group. Cooperation, you can see here with the ants, um, or uh, right here is the sea anemone with the clownfish. And then altruistic behavior is self-sacrificing behavior. So these are all social things that you learn to do in order to get along with your species or your group. And again, these are learned. These are not innate. You learn them from watching um, older individuals. Another way we have social communication is through pheromones, which are chemical signals. So I'm sure you've heard of pheromones um, in terms of the sex pheromones. Yes, that is how a female of a species is going to signal, hey, I'm ready um, to, to procreate. Um, we also have alarm pheromones. You can see here with the fish, if you put a little bit of alarm pheromone in the tank, they will all go towards the bottom. Um, so again, these are ways to alert or communicate within the group. Some other examples of pheromone usage, uh, mosquitoes use... Uh, CO2 in your blood to find you. That's how they know um, where to bite. Um, territory marking. So again, if you're territory, you're trying to show dominance, um, you urinate on something to show, hey, um, in your, the urine has pheromones to say, hey, this is my area. This is showing a female lion spreading her pheromones um, to kind of initial or, or signal to a male that she's ready to procreate. Circadian rhythm is your daily rhythm with your physiology and behavior. 
Um, it controls your sleep-wake cycle, your food consumption, your physical activity, body temperature, heart rate, lots of things. Um, the question now is, are you born with it or do you develop it? It's kind of one of those nature versus nurture questions. A lot of people think you're born with your circadian rhythm. Some people think you're not. If you think about, I'm a morning person, I'm a night person, a night owl. Um, we call this your biological clock. Um, the th four, three main types you can be is you can be nocturnal, which you're a night, you're awake during the night and asleep during the day. Diurnal is the opposite. You're awake during the day, asleep at night. Corpuscular is you're only awake from dawn to dusk. Um, so this is going to, you know, for example, if you are nocturnal, you generally sleep and have low physical activity during the day where that activity is going to kick up at night. Um, Tinbergen's four questions is about what causes the behavior. So why is this organism doing something? So you look at the causation, the development, the function, or the evolution. So you see the questions here. How does this behavior occur in an individual? So what's the cause? How does this behavior arise? Where did it come from? Why is this behavior adaptive? Why is it doing it? So what's the function or the value? And then how does this behavior arise in a species? Where did it evolve from? So this is ways of describing behavior in kind of four facets. Another way we look at Timberger's four questions is what we call the proximate versus ultimate cause. The proximate cause is the how an animal behaves and the ultimate is the why. So the proximate is the immediate cause of the behavior and the ultimate is kind of the evolutionary basis for it. So if we see the example here, we have a male stickleback fish attacking another male um, with the red belly thing. So the how is the red belly um, basically signs or stimulates the male to attack or aggression. And the ultimate or the why is by chasing away the other males, <clears throat> decreases those males are going to nest in its territory and pass their genes on instead of their, uh, their own. So again, all of this is kind of used to describe behavior. Um, we see a behavior and then the proximate ultimate cause and Tim Berger's questions are to describe the how and the why that behavior occurs.